Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis McGrath, and I will be the moderator for this Talks At with Jessica Long today to celebrate International Day of Persons with Disabilities 2020. I am a Googler working out of the Ann Arbor office on GCS's Accelerated Growth Team. Now, we will have a Q&A session towards the end of this talk, so if you have any questions for Jess, please feel free to add them to the comments section of this talk. Now, I'm moderating this talk today uh, because I am one of the office leads for the Ann Arbor chapter of the Disability Alliance Employee Resource Group, and because I've had the distinct privilege of competing with Jess on the US Paralympic swimming circuit. Although, if I'm being completely honest with you all, competing is probably <laughs> a bit too generous on my part. Um, I spent most of the time at our swim meets watching Jess from the stands while she set new world records and win medals in what seemed like every other event. And I remember the first time that I met Jess at the 2014 Can-Am Paralympic Championship in Minneapolis. It was the first international meet I had ever been to and by far the biggest competition I had ever participated in after years of competing in completely able-bodied competitions. It was uh, by far the most nervous I've ever felt in my entire life, just training and competing alongside Paralympians like Jess, who I had been looking up to for, for years. It was intimidating just to talk to them, but I'll never forget how kind and how welcoming Jess was to me and to all the other young swimmers. Jess is a star in the pool, on the motivational speaking circuit, and in literally everything that she does. So without further ado, here she is. <laughs> Jess, <laughs> how are you today? I am so great, thanks. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So I understand that right now you are currently training at the US and Olympic uh, Paralympic uh, Training Center in Colorado Springs. and. From my very limited experience, training for a normal Paralympics is unbelievably difficult by itself. So can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like to prepare for Tokyo 2021 this summer after the delay of the Paralympics last summer? Yeah, it's it's absolutely been wild. Um, uh, definitely just adapting my game plan, my just my thinking, my processing. Um, when we got the news that everything was delayed, um, it was definitely really hard, right? Just I was in the thick of training, ready to go. Everything was coming along. And then all of a sudden my pool shut down. So um, I was out of the water for about 75 days, kind of got back into swimming and then made the decision to come out here to the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center. And I'm currently in my dorm room right now, um, but it's been great. It's it's definitely a lot of hard work, right? Um, I've never expected training to be easy, but it's really great to be back out here in an elite atmosphere setting. Um, I'm swimming nine times a week, weightlifting sessions, abs, you name it, we're doing it. And the food, I mean, the food is designed for athletes. So you can just feel yourself getting better out here. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I can imagine it. It sounds like it. So um, I know that you go into pretty much every Paralympics with one goal on your mind, which is to win every piece of metal or every piece of silver where you possibly can. Yeah. So do you have any specific goals for this summer's Paralympics? Well, I do like the color gold. Uh, no, I, you know, it's been so, it's been such an incredible journey so far. I have been so fortunate to go to four Paralympic games. Of course, I want to stand on top of that podium, but at the same time, I'm just so grateful that I'm still a part of it. You know, it's, it's really hard to compete at an elite level uh, for 18 years. And, and that's kind of what I've been doing. And there were many moments and many times that I wanted to give up, but I'm still here. You know, I'm still, still fighting and I'm still learning. I think that's the most important thing is that I'm still learning so much with swimming. Um, but of course, you know, at the end of the day, I want to represent Team USA and, and bring home that gold medal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's what I love to hear. And I'm hoping that when we get to watch you in the Paralympics this summer, we will, we will see you at the top of that podium hearing the anthem for I don't know how many times it's been by now. Um, but for the conversation today, I'd like to take a bit of a step back. Um, and start talking about your background before you became one of the United States' greatest Paralympians of all time. So I wanna start at the beginning. So I know that you were born in Siberia and you moved to the US after you were adopted at a young age. And I know that you spent a lot of your early life, as we saw in the video, in hospitals. And I'm sure many of the people um, watching this video today 
can only imagine the pain and the fear that you encountered with like surgery after surgery as a child. So can you tell us more about what what that experience was like and how you coped with the pain and the fear of not knowing what your life held next? Yeah, this is such a good question. I, I was put up for adoption by a 16 year old Russian girl, adopted into an American family um, when I was one years old, one year old, one years old. Um, and they had two children, wanted a larger family, adopted two, and then ended up having two more. So I came from um, part of a big family. But um, I think for me growing up, there was a lot of confusion, I would definitely say. I didn't really understand what was happening. Um, I was born with something called fibular hemimelia, which basically means I was missing all the bones in my lower legs. I did have a foot on each leg uh, with three toes that they amputated six months after I was adopted so I could be fitted in prosthetic legs, I could learn how to walk. Um, but for me, you know, every time I grew, I had to get a surgery. And it felt like if we got the right leg done, we were going in for the left leg. And then once the left leg was done, it was back in for the right leg. And to me, the hospital was just a really scary place. It was confusing. Um, even though I got to pick out my, my hot pink colored casts, I, I still just didn't understand it. And I didn't understand why I had to go through so much pain. And see, I think the thing for me that people probably don't realize is, you know, I've never once just overcome and I've overcome a lot of things, but every day I'm overcoming obstacles. And it was no different when I was younger in those, those, those recovering from surgery. Um, after each one of those surgeries, I, I got fitted for a new pro set of prosthetics. And then I learned how to walk all over again. And that was just a really painful process. Um, I used to be pretty scared of going to the hospital. But as I got, you know, as I got older, it just kind of became something that, you know, I really struggled with why me? Why? What did I do wrong? Why was I born like this? Um, and it's kind of funny because I actually remember thinking this. Um, I'm a leap year baby. So I was one of my like leap year baby. Like I was turning, I think, three, three years old in leap year. Leap year. And I was tr my parents were trying to explain it to me. And I just remember having this moment where I thought, OK, like I'm adopted. I was born without my legs. And now I don't even get a birthday every year. So I, I really struggled with thinking like I did something wrong. And now, of course, I've, as I've gotten older, I just realized that, you know, why not me? Why why not me? You know, I, I definitely am strong. I'm definitely capable. And I've definitely learned that throughout my life. And I would say the number one thing when I look back was just that quitting wasn't an option. Absolutely not an option. And it's really gotten me this far. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I love what you just said there, Jess, about quitting not being an option, because I think, you know, obviously that was probably very difficult for you to develop that mindset as a, a young child. But I'm assuming it's one of those things that led you to sports and led you to compete at such a high level in the Paralympics. So can you tell me a little bit about how you made the transition from, you know, a, a young girl who was struggling to find her place to literally becoming one of the U.S.'s greatest Olymp Paralympians of all time? Thanks. Um, I was just really active. Apparently, I climbed on everything. I climbed on the refrigerator. I climbed on dressers. I would like jump into the ground. I somersaults and flips around the house. Um, we had a family trampoline, but I thought it was my trampoline um, where I would do backflips. And, and I just was really active. I didn't understand that I didn't even think that I was very different. You know, I knew that I was missing my legs, but I just did everything that my siblings did. And there was no special treatment in my house. Um, so my parents, they just, they saw how active I was and uh, they decided to put me in gymnastics. And I love gymnastics. Like from a young age, I actually wanted to be an Olympic gymnast. Um, but, you know, over time, just with training and or whatever I was doing, my parents were really afraid that I would damage my knees because when I'm not wearing my prosthetic legs, I walk on my knees. Um, I have about two inches of bone on each leg um, past the knee. So I'm a bilateral below knee amputee. Um, but basically, my parents were really afraid I would damage my knees. So we looked for a new sport. I'd always loved to swim. I used to think I was a mermaid. I, and I think the biggest thing was swimming and people, you know, in the Paralympics and swimming is that we're able to take off these heavy prosthetic legs, we or just arms or just getting out of a wheelchair, and you're just free. There's this freedom in the water that is so amazing, especially when you just feel the weight of, of prosthetics. And I first joined the team when I was 10 years old, only girl on the team without legs. Um, 
But, you know, I kept going back. And I think the big thing there is that I wasn't treated any differently. I was treated like I was their friend. And then I was their competitor. And then I started beating them. And, and it just took off. And then I found out about the Paralympics. And it was exactly what I needed. You know, I was afraid to show my legs. I, I was very ashamed of my legs. And then I went to my first Paralympic meet in Minnesota. Um, and I just fell in love with it. I, I was so amazed by the confidence that pe these people with disabilities, uh, they didn't care. And at that point, I refused to wear shorts. I only wore pants. So it really changed my perspective and it completely changed my life. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can totally relate to everything that you just said there. Um, you know, just the empowerment that competing in a competition like the Paralympics gives you. So um, just one of my favorite fun facts about you is that you actually trained alongside Michael Phelps and Bob Bowman, his coach, if, if people don't know who he is, um, at the height of Michael's Olympic performances. Mm -hmm. So that might surprise some people who are watching this video today who don't know a lot about the Paralympics and you know, quite frankly, how hard Paralympic athletes train. And I think it's because oftentimes when people think about the word disability, mm -hmm. they only see it as like a barrier or a roadblock to success. And they miss the fact that having a disability, like you said, can actually be a major asset in an individual's life and in their successes. So can you share with us a little bit more about what, A, what training with Michael Phelps was like, because that's crazy by itself. And secondly, just how you think your disability gave you an advantage during your time training at such a high level with Bob and with Michael. Yeah, wow. That was easily the most incredible thing. I, I up until that point, right before I decided to go train with Bob, I had competed in a couple Paralympics. And really what sparked this conversation with Bob to have me come and train um, on NBAC was just, I kind of got tired of people looking at me differently when I corrected them from being an Olympian to a Paralympian. And you could instantly see that they would be so impressed that I, they thought I was an Olympian. And I'd be like, well, yes, I am, but like I'm a Paralympian. And for those who don't know, the word para in Paralympian just means parallel to the Olympic Games. We are alongside the Olympics. Um, but you also have so many different abilities in the Paralympics. And you know, for me, I'm obviously missing my legs, but I always wanted to see where I kind of stood with the Olympians, just because I kind of just, again, I wanted to prove, I'm always proving myself, but I just wanted to prove that I was just as good as the Olympians. So um, I had the opportunity to, to go, I moved back home. Um, I moved home to Baltimore from the Olympic Training Center. I used to live here. And, um, and it was the hardest thing I think I've ever done. I, I could not show up and I had to give 110%. And these workouts were Olympic size workouts. I mean, I was on the team with like all Olympic guys that were like six, eight, I'm on my knees, like barely three feet. Um, it was hard, it was definitely hard, but it was it was incredible. And I think it was such a learning moment. It's such a, it was such a learning moment for me and for Bob and maybe Michael. Like I wanted to change the Olympic the Olympians, their perception, their perception of even the Paralympics. And I think I did that, you know, every day I showed up, I worked really, really hard. Um, there was also so many funny moments, moments where Bob would be like, kick harder, kick harder. And I'd be like, Bob, what, what would you like me to do? Like, you know, I'd, I'd feed into it a little bit, but it was incredible. And I think the big thing there is that I was given a chance, that I was given a chance to train with Olympic athletes. And it was me and probably 16 other Olympians. And I loved it. I loved that challenge. I loved showing up every day and being the girl with no legs and training with Michael was incredible. I mean, he is the greatest. He's an incredible guy, a great dad. Um, I'm super proud of him and everything that he's, he's doing right now with his life. But, um, there was this one moment. Okay. I think this is such a cute story, but it was like around Thanksgiving and I came into practice. I didn't think it was going to be that hard. It was hard. I was the last one out. Everyone was done. And my legs were like leaning up against the wall. And I like, I walk on my knees. So I just like, was like waddling back. It took me forever to finish that practice. And I'll just never forget. He like got lower, opened up his arms, gave me a big hug and was like, good job, JLo. And I was like, thanks. Like I made an, I made it through another practice. Um, but no, it was incredible. And just, just that opportunity to start on that team and be a part of that team. Um, it, it was just, I think it was everything that just I needed, you know, just to kind of solidify that I, I'm an elite athlete and I will never question that. <laughs> Absolutely. That is, uh, that's an incredible story. And uh, the, the part about it that I want to build on Jess is what you were saying about giving you that chance, giving you that opportunity. Cause I think as you and I both know, 
just coming by that chance and getting that opportunity for a lot of people with disabilities is very, very difficult to come by. So earlier today, I asked you about how your experience helped you develop the ability to cope effectively with your pain and with your fear and with your uncertainty. And um, in companies like Google today, workers are expected to be able to navigate ambiguity and become comfortable operating in uncomfortable circumstances. So sort of like you did when you were training with Michael. So seizing that opportunity, even though there might be you know, 20 different factors or 20 different people telling you all the different reasons why you might fail. So I guess my question for you would be, can you share with us sort of the, the turning point in your life where you began to develop the resilience necessary to become comfortable being uncomfortable in those situations and to, you know, have the confidence to seize that opportunity when you've got it. Yeah, honestly, I think I'm still working on this area to be uncomfortable. Um, but I also really love that. I love getting out of my comfort zone and being uncomfortable. But the turning point for me, um, I mean, it's still such a process, right? But I would just say there was a moment where I, I realized just I had to really focus on not being ashamed of who I am and the way that I was born. And that is a process. And I think there was this moment that it really, like my entire life, I, I had always battled with that, just being being ashamed. And even though I was strong and tough and I had won gold medals and set world records, I, I still felt really, I still felt a lot of shame and resentment towards the way that I was born. And there was this moment that I was just kind of, you know, I'm, I think I was only like, I think I was 22, 23, that I was actually at Starbucks getting my coffee. And it just kind of hit me then that I have had the power all along for the way that people perceive me. And hang tight with me for a while. I try to explain this. But basically, if I just kind of handle my, my lack of legs with insecurity and resentment, people will do the same. They will kind of respond to the way that I respond. But if I respond with positivity and just excitement and I sh am willing to share my story, people, um, they're excited, they're eager, they want to learn. And I, I think that's the big thing is that people do want to learn. And I have really tried to turn that why me into why not me. And again, I want to share my experiences. I want to share that, hey, it's not always easy, but let me tell you about my story. And that's definitely helped. But again, it's a learning process. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still learning to accept myself. But for the most part, I've realized that I have had the power all along. And I think that's such a cool, cool thing once you just realize and coming to terms that, um, I'm so much more capable than I even thought. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that perspective, Jess, is just incredible. And I actually want to build on that point a little bit that you made about, you know, the, the perspective that you have of yourself is also the perspective that other people have of you. Because I know that, like, a lot of people with disabilities find it difficult to be able to talk about their disabilities and to share mm -hmm. it. And on the, on the flip side of things, a lot of able-bodied people or even, like, the, the relatives and the friends of people with disabilities don't even know how to have that conversation in the first place. And then there ends up being this awkward interaction where, you know, one person doesn't want to talk about their disability, the other person doesn't want to ask about it. And then, you know, there's just like a lot of, I think, sometimes misconceptions that come across because it's so hard to have that communication. So have you learned anything like in that, in your sort of ex life experience that like might be a, like a best way to, for somebody either with a disability or without a disability to start having that conversation so that we can start to discuss this and make it less of a, you know, a taboo topic. Totally, yeah. You know, I am so open and so comfortable, but also you have to recognize that not everyone is. Um, there was one time I saw someone, I get so excited when I see other MPTs. Uh, there was this one time I was leaving like a grocery store and I saw this, this gentleman in a wheelchair without his legs. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm missing my legs. So I went right over and I was like, you're missing your legs. I'm missing my legs. How are you? Like, look, like these are my prosthetics. And come to find out he had just lost his legs like two weeks ago. Um, but also I think he kind of in some way, like we had a really good conversation it wasn't bad but also just recognizing that some people don't want to talk about it and that's totally okay um i think it's just i don't know i think we're still navigating that i think i think i'm totally okay to talk about it but you also have to really just kind of just read read the room if you will um I wouldn't keep pushing if, if someone really doesn't want to talk about it, just, you know, go about your day and it's okay. And to be honest, some days I have really, I have really bad days where people will say the wrong thing. And I'm like, in those moments, I sometimes think to myself, is it my job to educate them? And that's a really tough line to kind of figure out. Like, 
I want to educate. I want to continue to grow the Paralympic movement. I want people to know what amputees are capable of. But um, everyone's different. And I think we have to understand that some people are willing to talk about it and others aren't. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Totally it's cool. a process, right? It totally and, you know, <laughs> people, people with disabilities have bad days just like anybody else. And, you know, I, I totally hear you there. It's, it's yeah. just important to be willing to have the conversation, but not necessarily. Sorry. Were you going to say something there? I had a thought. I did. Just, it's not. I would just say it's not incredible if I go and get coffee. It's not incredible if I carry groceries to the car. Like, that's not incredible for being an amputee. I want people to recognize me as an athlete. I think that, like, totally talk about those accomplishments. But I've had people come up and be like, you go, girl, or good for you, or you you left the house today like that. And I'm like, yeah, what? We are we are so capable and strong. And I think that's just my point is, like, it's, it's not – that incredible if I go on a walk. Like I'm just living my life and I want people to be inspired. I don't mind if people are inspired, but I want you to be inspired and really, really inspired by my accomplishments because that's what I've worked really hard for. So. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. So Jess, I wanna take the conversation back to one of the points that you made earlier about having that positive and resilient attitude that just helps you, you know, power through your daily life, but also, you know, competing at the highest level of sport. So. As you and I know, that positive attitude, that resilient attitude is not uncommon among people with disabilities, particularly those who compete and train at a high level in the Paralympics. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, you know, like we, we've sort of touched on this a little bit already, but like, how do you think that unique perspective you have as a person with a disability where you have to struggle, let's call it for what it is, struggle and be challenged literally every day of your life? How do you think that perspective has impacted your success in both your swimming career and in your personal life? Yeah, so I think for so long, I always felt like I had this like chip on my shoulder, like I had to prove to everyone that I was good enough. And that fired me up for a long time. But, you know, as I've gotten older and I've gained just perspective and I've transitioned into kind of like an older athlete, <laughs> I definitely, you know, I I don't want to prove anything anymore. If anything, I want to prove to the next generation that they are capable and strong, too, and that if I can do it, they can do it. And I think that has really shifted my motivation, my excitement for the sport, where Paralympics is going, is that if truly, if I can do it, you can do it, too. And I'm so excited for the next little girl to come up and break my records. Just Hopefully it's not for a little while, but I, that excites me, right? That that we have so many different platforms out there that, you know, the next generation are growing up to, to have such good role models and to feel that they are capable and strong too. Absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully it's not this summer at Tokyo either. Um, but <laughs> I, do, I do just wanna to touch on um, what you were starting to, to bring up there, which is sort of the, the bigger picture here because you sort of came up in the, in the Paralympics at the same time that the Paralympics was really kicking off and really becoming something that was more internationally recognized and becoming more promoted. I mean, you talk to people 10 years ago, they wouldn't know what the Paralympics is. Now you talk to somebody, maybe about 50%, maybe a little bit less would know what the Paralympics is. Um, and I want to start like driving this conversation towards the bigger picture here. So um, we discussed that, you know, like having this perspective um, sort of came about like this resilience and this positivity came about from you dealing with those surgeries at a young age and dealing with like the being uncomfortable in your own skin uh, almost. So I guess what I'm wondering is why do you think that perspective that you have is so common among you know your fellow Paralympic teammates as well as just other people with disabilities in general? Yeah, you know, I think we all grew up feeling like we want to fit in and that we have to prove that we are capable. But you know, I'm really, I'm really glad that people's perceptions of people's perceptions of people with disabilities are changing and it should, you know, I want everyone to keep that grit and to keep fighting. But I also want people to recognize that people with disabilities are capable. And um, I think again, like I said in the beginning is we, we don't have any other options, but to, to keep pressing forward, to keep pushing, to keep moving forward. And I think if there's one thing I've learned with being around people with disabilities is that these, we don't quit. Quit, again, quitting is not an option. And I think when you, you really develop that mindset and you really set the tone for your life, like you you just see these incredible people do incredible things or people with disabilities because we don't know anything else. Like we don't know how to do anything else but to keep keep moving forward. 
Thanks. Right, because that's the mindset you have to t attack every day of your life with, right? Like you can't live as somebody with a disability without having that, you know, no quit mentality. Because otherwise, like like you said, you'd you'd spend all your time inside. So um, yeah. I do want to keep the conversation going more towards the the broader side of things because in recent years, thanks to activists like you, um, mm -hmm. the athletic world specifically has made significant strides towards creating and promoting a more inclusive environment for people with disabilities. Um, one of the best examples of that being the consolidation of the US and Olympic Paralympic Committee. Some people on the call today might not know that that's a thing. They used to be separate, but in recent years, they were actually combined. So I, I know that you've sort of been on the inside and you've been one of those strong voices advocating for more inclusion in the athletic sphere. So can you speak to, you know, sort of how a process like that happens in sort of like an organizational level? Absolutely. Well. Also, I mean, even within the athletes, right? It's so many people who have paved the way and paved the way for me, and I hope to pave the way for the next generation. Um, we are definitely on the right track. You know, it's taken us a little while, but I'm so glad we're here. We are now getting equal pay. Even here out at the Olympic, it used to be the Olympic Training Center. It's now the Olympic and Paralympic Training Center, and that's super exciting. But um, I, I would say a lot of it is really accredited, like accredited to the athletes um, just because they you know I know that my one of my biggest role models Erin Erin Popo, Popovich who was another Paralympic athlete she really paved the way for me she was getting sponsorships when no other Paralympic athletes were getting sponsorships she was being televised I mean there were so many things that she was doing that because of her you know it, it, it allowed me to have these opportunities and I hope to, you know, pass on that torch to the next generation. Um, but I've always had a fire, you know, I, I, we're, we compete for one team. We compete for team USA. And even though we have our Olympians and our Paralympians, we are one team. And I think if there's one thing I want people to really recognize that, and um, we've come a long way, especially with changing our name, uh, operation gold. That was huge. That was a big day. I will always remember where I was on that day when we found out that we will, we would get equal pay for our medals. Um, but with anything, right. I, I think maybe that's being an athlete, but you know, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm not ever satisfied, but I want to keep pushing for the best until it's completely, you know, all completely equal. But yeah, we've definitely come a long way and I'm really proud. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, the, the strides that you and the other Paralympic athletes have, you know, enabled the athletic world to, to do is, is just incredible. So I do want to take that one step further and I want to ask you, what, and this is a bit of a more heavy hitting question, but why do you think a process like that hasn't happened in other areas, such as, for example, the, the technology workforce? Mm -hmm. You know, well, I don't know much about tech, <laughs> but I do know that, you know, people can be really uncomfortable if someone doesn't look like them. And, you know, I, I've seen what we, you know, people with disabilities can do. And I think we really have to adapt this mindset of just how capable people are um, with disabilities. And I think it all starts with just giving them a chance. You know, I, I think I've said that from kind of the beginning that just that opportunity, that chance, we want it. We're eager, we are here, we are ready, but we also need that chance. We need to step in the door. And um, we also need to just have access, you know, to, to, to start and uh, just like I was given that chance on NBAC to train with Michael Phelps and Bob Bowman, um, I would say the same in the workplace is just giving people with disabilities a start would be uh, would be my advice. Yeah, absolutely. Give them a chance and, and see what happens, right? Because, um, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And um, as a follow up to that, Jess, uh, I know that you and I have both seen multiple studies that show that individuals with disabilities represent an untapped candidate pool for businesses, um, especially with an aging and a shrinking workforce in a company like the US. Um, mm -hmm. But as we've discussed, many companies have actually been slow to recruit people with disabilities due to concerns like you were bringing up about, you know, the extra costs associated with improving the accessibility of workplaces and also improving the accessibility of their recruitment efforts. Yeah. So um, I guess my my last question for you before we start diving into the questions, which again, quick plug, if you have any questions, throw them in the comment section. Um, but what do you think Google can do specifically to help pave the way for the next thousand Jessica Longs, not just in the pool, but also in the workplace? <laughs> well, for me, the number one thing would be an endless supply of iced coffee. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> seriously, we I, do we do have that at Google, actually. <laughs> oh my gosh, I need to come. Um, 
No, but I think one thing just, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think they think they're going to offend me if they ask questions about my legs, um, like it will hurt my feelings. And I just want to say that it will not hurt my feelings. What will hurt my feelings is if people just look at me and we just continue on and we just don't ask questions sometimes. You know, I I, I have good days and bad days. And I, I said that earlier. Um but I think we need to almost in some way get over ourselves. You know, I think we need to just do it, just go for it. And just like I do it every day in swim practice. Yeah. I jump in the pool and I start. And I would say the same thing kind of for Google is just to just start. Um, also, I think um, just knowing where to find more dis, uh, people with disabilities um, to bring into the workplace, like, you know, whether that's going to the Challenge Athlete Foundation events, um, coming to a Paralympic meet, I can introduce you to a lot of incredible people with disabilities who are incredible athletes who have discipline, determination, and they're very passionate. Um, and then finally, I... You know, starting, I definitely think that's number one. Um, I would just like to say, take a chance. Open up a door. Open up a door for people that many companies seem to still have closed. Um, and then I'm stealing this from your own guidelines, but just don't be evil. And when you see something that isn't right, speak up. I think that's huge. Speak up. And here, you know, being a Paralympic athlete, I hope to speak up for those who can't, especially in the Paralympic movement. Um, and I hope to continue doing what I'm doing for those who are coming up and paving, who will pave the way for the future. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that was a fantastic answer, Jess. And now um, I do want to transition over into the questions, uh, the Q&A from the audience, because it seems like we've got a lot of questions um, there. So just to kick things off, our first question um, says that you are amazing. That is absolutely true. Um, <laughs> I was uh, a swimmer for 12 years, so I know the struggle of grueling and cold practices. Uh, how do you stay motivated, especially when you feel like you've hit a wall with your best time? And that question comes from uh, Molly Force. Oh, great question. Um, yes, definitely the water is so cold. That's the hardest part is just jumping in. Um, but I would say I really stay motivated or how I stay motivated. It's not easy, right? I think we all go through seasons, moments where it's tough, moments where it seems really easy. Um, swimming is not an easy sport, you know that. But um, when I feel like giving up, I go back to that little Russian girl who was 10 years old joining a swim team and just fell in love with the sport. And for me, it started with passion and, and that passion hasn't gone away. If anything, it's just, it's, it's still burning and it's still there. And I love improving. And I love that about swimming is that I'm still learning and it's frustrating and I can have uh, like three weeks of bad practices. And then all of a sudden I have a great one. And it's like, Oh, this is why I'm doing it. But, uh, I just, I, I think it starts with loving what you do and just having the passion for it and you'll go far. Absolutely. And then I do just want to ask you a quick follow up to Molly's question, because I know that earlier you had mentioned that, you know, you have you feel like you have good days in the pool. You also have bad days in the pool, just like everybody else. So in those days where it does seem hard to to find that passion, like obviously you love swimming. But as as we both know, like when you're in the pool at 5 a.m. in the morning, it's it's kind of hard to love it. So um, are there any <laughs> are there any like, um, you know, behaviors or strategies that you use to try to you know, take a step back and, and find that passion within yourself again? Yeah, you know, one thing I did actually after the 2016 games, I took up coaching, which I've never thought I would do. Um, I coach an all girls uh, swim team and it was incredible. It totally took the, you know, it totally took, took everything kind of away from me. Like just, it wasn't about me anymore. It was super, it was super cool to give back everything that I've learned to these, these girls. And, um, it helped me if anything, it changed my perspective. It helped me fall in love with swimming. So I would say kind of see if you can switch it up, um, change your surrounding if you can, your surroundings, if you can, but also just goal setting, I would say is really important. That keeps me going. Um, especially when the days are, are long and cold, you know, cold jumping in the pool. Um, but it's not easy. I don't think it's meant to be easy. And it's in those moments when I'm super sore, I can't lift my arms and I'm looking out at the pool and I think, how am I going to make it through this practice? And to be honest, those are the best practices. Those are the ones I remember, the moments where I didn't think I could do it. And then somehow I finished that practice. And when I look back on my career, I have finished every single tough practice. I've never quit. And I think that's reassuring too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a uh... Great answer, Jess. So I think we've got a couple of other 
questions for you. So if we could see the next one. Okay. So this question actually comes from one of my colleagues in the Disability Alliance, John Ross. Um, and he says, in your experience, what progress as a society have you seen related to use of the word and label of disability or disabled? And where do you feel there is room to improve? Yeah, this is a really good question. You know, I... It's so funny. I've never, and mostly every person I know who has a disability, it's, and it's always hard to even say that word. I, I don't feel like I have a disability. And I know it's almost kind of cheesy to say, but I've always been like, I have such an ability. Like, and it's kind of hard because I, I, I put on two prosthetics and I look completely normal, you know? But I also recognize that every, everyone's challenge is different. And I, I think that's the word that I really like is challenge. You know, I definitely, I've always disliked the word disability, but it's like the thing that you say, like people get it when I say, oh, just, dis you know, disability. Um, but I've really tried to switch over to more just like challenge, like what is her challenge? Um, cause, and I think that is kind of a better way of saying it because I think everyone has challenges. And I think everyone, whether it's visible, whether it's something you're going through internally, we all have challenges. And I think that um, once we kind of recognize that everyone's going through something, um, we're just a little bit kinder. But I like the word challenge more compared to disability or disabled. I don't know. I've never seen felt disabled. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm on the same page with you there. Like, it's not like the word itself sort of lends itself to a lack of ability or a lack of you know being able to do something. Which obviously, as we see in your case, that is not the case. So I mm -hmm. guess you know just sort of as a follow up question to that, um, I think one of the really interesting things about again, I'm going to use the word, so apologies for that. But one yeah. of the interesting things about the about disabilities is that there is such a wide range of them. Yeah. And there are there are visible disabilities, which obviously might be the first thing that people think of, they think of people in a wheelchair, or they think of, you know, amputees, but then there's also invisible disabilities. And um, there are also half visible disabilities like yours, because you know, if you're wearing if you're wearing pants, um, and walking around, like people wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. So, um, so can you just speak a little bit to sort of what sort of the nuances between that, because I, I think a lot of people in our audience might be interested to hear about your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I see everything within the Paralympics. I see every type of challenge, disability you can think of. But what just came to mind with what you were saying, um, I get a lot of negative comments when I park in handicap because I have somewhat of an vis invisible disability. And that's the first time I've seen it, like just firsthand, how people can be if they don't truly understand. And I do think that's kind of comical because we were definitely in 2020 and, and we have more technology and more access than ever before. Um, I would say it really boils down to just, honestly, I would say just being kind. You know, I, I definitely get those comments where people are like, you shouldn't be parking in handicap. And I'm like, well, wait, like I am actually missing my legs. Um, so that sometimes is, you know, that's an interesting piece. But um, I would definitely just say, we really have to recognize that everyone is going through something. I think that's the best way that I can process just that, you know, everyone, everyone's going through something and um, you may not be going through what I'm going through and I may not be going th through what you're going through, but as long as we're kind and understanding towards each, towards each other, I think you can go really far with kindness. To me, kindness is like the number one thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's all about empathy, right? Like if every, if we recognize that everybody's going through the same challenges, then we can be, you know, teammates in life, uh, if that doesn't sound too cheesy and like work, <laughs> work together to to address them. Because like you said, like they're, you know, everybody's got challenges, whether they take the form of a quote unquote disability or whether it's, you know, the loss of a loved one or, you know, whatever the personal circumstances might be. And like you said, I think we have a lot more in common between those challenges and how we deal with them. And I think that that can potentially pave the way forward for um, for more acceptance in society. So I know we've got a lot of other questions. I could ask you a thousand questions, as you know, but um, let's go ahead and uh, take the next one. All right, so another one of my colleagues in the Disability Alliance, uh, Lindsay Nicholas, uh, her question for you is about your book writing. So um, as we've discussed, you are a published author. You wrote the book, Unsinkable. So quick plug, go buy Jess's book um, from wherever you can. Um, but what was your process for writing your book? And what advice would you give to other um, budding authors? Yeah, this was such a cool process. I actually got to write it with my little sister, Hannah. Um, and for me, what I really wanted this book to be was just 
vulnerable. I wanted to show just my vulnerability because I've always been that tough athlete, that tough girl. Um, so that was kind of the process. But also I, I didn't feel like we could even start the book until I went back to Russia to meet my biological family. And I thought that was going to happen way later in life. Um, so there's a big section of that. Um, but I actually met my birth mom who married my birth father and they have three children. And I kind of talk about that process. But um, before any of this, um, I'll never forget, I was driving to swim practice with my dad. I was like 10 years old, had just joined the swim team. And it was really special because it was kind of our time together. And um, he just kind of, he leaned over, just kind of said something like, Jess, I think one day you're going to have a book. And I was like, okay, dad, like I'd never done anything in Paralympics at that point. Um, but he was right. And uh, that kind of planted the seed. And, and um, I did not feel like the book could be completed unless I went back or unless I found my biological family. So it's kind of cool how everything worked out. But I would just say this, that everyone has a story. That's something I love. I love listening to people's stories. I, I think it's so fascinating. I love just just hearing, just just being motivated by that because everyone has a moment in their story where they feel like giving up and they, they didn't, you know? Um, so I would just say, write it all, write it down write, share your story, even if it's just for you. Um, I think that's really important to just get it out. And I definitely know the process with my sister was super sweet. It was really hard. If anything, it felt like therapy sessions every time we went through this book. It's a lot of moments of my life. Um, but it's been super cool to get uh, Instagram posts with girls holding up my book. And it's just such a surreal thing. Um, it's really special. And I definitely have other books in mind. Um, so yeah, keep a lookout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we will definitely keep our eye out for all of your future works. Um, but I did want to ask you a quick follow-up question to that. So I know that you said one of like the big themes in terms of your writing was vulnerability and looking into sort of the parts of your life that were the most challenging and probably were very difficult to go over, um, you know, having the conversation. So uh, I don't want to go too into too much detail because obviously we still want people to go buy your book. Um, but uh, I like the point to go back to your point earlier about the challenge, like having a disability is a challenge. I have to imagine also being adopted was one of the other challenges, big challenges in your life. And I have to imagine that, I, I can't even imagine, like trying to fly back home to find my biological family and then trying to reestablish ties with them and all of the different you know, challenges and difficulty that comes with that. So again, don't wanna give away too much detail in the book because we do want people to buy it. But can you tell us a little bit about maybe like how your experience with your challenge of having a disability helped you tackle some of those other challenges in your life? like reconnecting with your with your birth family yeah it's so funny like for so long I was so angry and I think a lot of my success in the pool was fueled by anger and I thought that anger was strength I thought it was you know I couldn't show weakness I couldn't and I think a lot of that probably you know with being an amputee going in for surgeries I mean I as a little girl thought that they would still like my parents would send me back to Russia if I misbehaved like you just when you're adopted, you have these crazy ideas and these crazy thoughts. And, you know, thankfully I was adopted into a really incredible family. Um, but those, those thoughts are still really real. And then to feel like a burden, like to not have legs and to be in and out of surgeries and just everything, there was so much attention on me. And I was like, I don't even want this attention. Um, it was hard. You know, I was definitely just really angry. And that again, fueled all of my, you know, helped in the pool. But as I got older, you know, I, I, those layers started coming off. And I think that's one thing I wanted people to realize is just that it is, you know, I, I thought for so long that being angry was so powerful, like to, to be tough, but really what I think is the most powerful, powerful thing now is to just be open and vulnerable. And I feel like I've been able to help more people with the adoption piece now that I've been able to process it. And I'm still processing it. It's like, it's never, it's never just not over, but that's where people can relate. You know, people think it's incredible that I'm missing my legs. Sure. But when I talk about my adoption and what I, you know, going back to Russia, meeting my birth mom, I think that was me being really brave. That was so hard. Um, and I never expected my birth mom to still be married to my birth father and then to have three children and that I was the oldest. Um, you know, it was just, it was wild, but also forgiveness. I think forgiveness is huge. It takes time, but uh, yeah, it's definitely been a process. And um, I don't know if people even know this, but you can go watch the entire thing online. Um, I went, I actually, 
I was right now, six years ago, flying to Russia. I think it was like right around today, or tomorrow. Um, but you can go and watch the whole thing. You can see the moment where I meet my birth mom for the first time. Um, I was actually born Tatiana. She named me Tatiana Olegovna Kirilova. Um, and then when I came to the US, they gave me an American name. Um, but now it's really special. And I definitely hope um, that people are just moved by that, just more the vulnerability over the, just the anger, because anger is heavy. <laughs> wow, um, that's uh, that, that's an incredible answer, Jess. And we will, we'll see if we can get that, that video linked in the description of this video somehow so that people can access it a little bit easier. But again, I feel like I'm monopolizing your time a little bit. We've got more questions. So um, yeah, if we could get the next question, please. All right, so we have a question from Max um, and quick follow up to this. So are you in touch with your siblings in Siberia? And what would you recommend to kids who want to start their sports career in, in Brotsk? Um, he says, I was born in a town 200 miles away from Brotsk uh, where you were born. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a crazy small world. Um, first question. Um, yes, I'm still in touch with my siblings. Um, my older, the older, no, I'm the oldest, the sister, my sister had a little baby. So I have like a niece, which is crazy. Um, we FaceTime a few times. We write on Facebook, um, which is really cool, but it's also still kind of still a process. It's still kind of bizarre. I was raised in such, you know, such an incredible family. There's, that's my family. I'm a lo I'm Jessica Long, but also I was born Tatiana Olegovna Kirilova. So it's kind of like, oh, wow, this is, it's a lot at times, but, um, I notice I do it when I'm when I'm ready. You know, I don't I don't ever force it. When I feel comfortable and ready to do those FaceTimes, um, when I write them, that's kind of you know I've learned to just say no if I'm if I'm not okay that day, if I need a break or if I need a few weeks. Um, but yes, we are still in touch. And then I would just say for advice, um, I mean, social media is great. It's a great platform. Get your stuff out there. Um, learn as much as you can. Do as much research as you can. Um, I think that is all really great. There's so many resources out online and then just, yeah, go forward from there. Absolutely. It's all about just getting started, right? Just got to, you want to get good at swimming? You got to get in the pool, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got to show up to practice. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I know we've got a couple more questions here and I want to make sure that we can get to as many as possible. So uh, could we get the uh, next one, please? All right, so we have a question from Frankie's uh, Frankie's dance tutorials. Uh, what are your thoughts on the disproportion of wealth among athletes? So, for example, Michael has been able or has managed to obtain many many sponsors, while other athletes who make um, the OT receive nowhere as much after a full career. And obviously, that's even more emphasized. I think we've seen in the Paralympics because you know there are less sponsors for Paralympic athletes than there are for standard Olympic athletes. So. Can you tell us just a little bit more maybe about like what your experience has been like there and you know just your perspective on the situation as a whole? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you could talk to any athlete, especially a Paralympic athlete where yeah, I mean we we want more, of course. You know, I think one thing people have to realize is as a Paralympic athlete, I'm training like this is like my full-time job. Like I'm training nonstop hours and hours a day. Um and it's definitely, you know, when they announced the Operation Gold, it was such a monumental day. But also I had looked back on my whole career and all the medals that I had already won. And I was like, we were getting maybe a quarter before, like what like what they were getting. So it's like, oh, like if it was already equal, which it should have been, um, that hurt a little bit. But yeah, I definitely think we need to continue to improve that. That's when I say I'm not fully satisfied. I think that there does, need, there does need to be more equal pay. Um, I have been fortunate to have some pretty incredible sponsors who really have allowed me to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, but I'm really impressed with athletes um, who are really kind of almost on their own. I think one area I would really love to see change is our monthly stipend. That's still not where it needs to be. That's one thing that, um, yeah, it's not at all where it needs to be. It's not even enough to live on. Um, so that's an area that I'm pushing for. I want to keep bringing it up. Um, but that's kind of what it is, right? It's 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 not giving up. It's it's addressing these tough topics. It's um, demanding more change and, and equality for the Olympic and Paralympics. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know earlier in the call, Jess, you mentioned Aaron, um, who sort of paved the way for you in terms of like being one of the first Paralympic athletes that had a lot of sponsors and it sort of set you up to be able to get the sponsors that you have today and like all the great work that you're doing 
is going to be able to you know pave the way for some other people down the line. So um, I, just to dive into the specifics of that a little bit more, other than you know demanding that you get you know compensated for for the great work that you're doing and and what you, the work that you put in, what what else have you sort of done, and what what did you see Aaron do that that really helped change the perception of some of these sponsors who you know might have had the perception that you know they don't want to. Uh, sponsor a Paralympic athlete or, you know, they would rather sponsor an Olympic athlete versus a Paralympic one. Yeah. Well, Erin was just, I mean, she was incredible, especially you think this was what, 15 years ago, 15. I mean, we're still, you know, the Paralympics is still growing. I think what, when it comes up uh, Tokyo, it's only going to be the second time it's like actually really televised. Um, but she, she just was such a champion in the pool and, you know, outside of the pool. And I think, just her character spoke really loud. So of course people paid attention. She was breaking world records. She was such an awesome person. And that to me, that was, that's what I wanted to be like. She was my role model. You know, I, I, we all need role models. Um, and I love, I love really tough, uh, strong women. Um, I know she was with some incredible companies. Um, and because of her, I was able to eventually be sponsored by some of them. But the super cool thing that I do want to talk about is we're at a place where there are, like sponsorships are sponsoring the same, like there are, they are sponsoring Paralympic athletes and Olympic athletes. And, um, I am so fortunate enough to work with so many incredible people. Um, arena, my swim sponsor, they are incredible. I got to design my own swimming suit with them. Um, as a Paralympic athlete, they put me on one of the, like the covers of one of the swim magazines showing my legs. So like we are making improvements. Um, Toyota does a fantastic job with this, especially just you look around and it's like all the Olympians and all the Paralympians we're all just together. We're like each other's friends. So Toyota has been incredible. Um, Bridgestone as well. I mean, literally they're, they're it is changing and that's what makes me so excited. And that's why every time I'm like a part of my sponsorship events and I see like the Olympic symbol next to like the Olympic, the Paralympic symbol next to the Olympic symbol, I'm like almost in tears because it was not that way. Like, okay, there was a time we were doing this media summit and we do it every, you know, every time before like a, an Olympics and Paralympics. And I was there, I was one of the top Paralympic athletes with two other paras and you just knew that other news outlets didn't want to talk to us. And in fact, we went into one of the rooms and they're like, we don't need them. We don't have any questions for them. And it has changed. Like it is incredible now, but there was a time. And I just remember thinking one day this will not be like this. So I'm pushing for change. Um, I get excited to see what, what it's going to be like in LA 2028. 20, and I hope to keep swimming till then. But. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's incredible. Jess, especially the fact that, you know, obviously you're doing this so that you can have your own personal success, but the fact that you're so focused on paving the way for other people and focused on so many more people other than just yourself is just phenomenal. I'm sure you hear that all the time, but I just want to make sure to reinforce that a bit. So um, I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I think we have one or two more questions. So if we could um, get that last question up. All right. So we have a question from Maya, who's actually on my team here at Google. So uh, hello, Maya. And Maya says, what are a few specific actionable things that people can do to be better allies to people with disabilities? Yeah, um, I a few things come to mind. Um, I mean, obviously social media, I think that's incredible, just supporting people with disabilities, just, I think that's awesome. There's a lot of events out there, you know, get involved, right? It's, it's one thing to, to support it, but also, right, action, take action, come to a Paralympic meet, come volunteer, we always need volunteers. Um, learn more about it ways that maybe just striking up a conversation is your is your building accessible um i don't know thinking about comments thinking about things that are said just it's so hard to stand up and to do the right thing but it is so worth it and i think just just thinking about that in your everyday life um I think that will go a long way. But yeah, taking action, getting involved. I think the Athlete Challenge Foundation is incredible. Um, I really, really love you know supporting them. The Women's Sports Foundation, I think they do an incredible job um, having the Olympic and the Paralympic athletes together. Um, so yeah, I would just say get involved. I think that's kind of the, the best thing is uh, support it, but also if you can take it a step further and help out in any way, uh, that's huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just plug that. Like if you go to one of these Paralympic swim meets, like you think Jess is amazing. Obviously she is, but you should see some of those other, other athletes in the pool. It will really, um, 
change your entire perception on what people, what you think people with disabilities can do. So, you know, Jess, we're coming up on time here. We've got about a minute and a half left, but I did want to save a little bit of time for you to just have a last word. So I know that, you know, again, you've done a ton of work paving the way for future generations, um, especially for athletes with disabilities and especially for young female athletes as well. So with this last minute, um, just wanted to ask, is there anything that you uh, you would like to share um, so that when this video does go public on YouTube, um, those, those those kids that look up to you can, can have something to, to take home with them? Absolutely. I would say find your passion. That to me is the biggest thing. Find what you're passionate about. And go after it. You got to be consistent. You got to have, you got to make sacrifice, a lot of sacrifices, but it is so worth it. And when you love something, you define your own success. You don't have to be a gold medalist like me to be successful, but you should set your goals high. And, and I believe that if you do those few things, you will be very successful. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today, Jess. I know you have a crazy schedule right now and you probably have to run back to practice this afternoon. Hopefully you don't have the ropes today, um, but just <laughs> thank you again for your time and thank you for being willing to share your story with Google and uh, with, with the rest of the world. Um, so that's it for our talks at and um, yeah, thank you again. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Absolutely.